the reputation of the 152 millimeter uh, gun howitzer used on the SU-152 and SU-152 is pretty pretty widespread. Uh, this gun fired, depending on the type of ammunition, a high explosive shell wearing, uh, weighing 40 to 50 kilograms, packed with five or six kilos of HE. And so upon impact to all but the thickest of armor, the effect was devastating. Uh, I have a picture on my blog, as you've probably seen, where a hit on the side of a Panther turret actually caused a breach on the opposite side of the turret just because of how powerful the blast was. It is no coincidence that the Germans nicknamed this type of vehicle Dossenhofner a uh, can opener. But that's not why we're here. If you want to read about the ISU-152 and its big gun, you can go on my blog. I have a whole article about that. Today, I want to talk to you about a much more humble and much less known alternative, 76 millimeter field guns. Uh, it turns out that this type of weapon was actually still a very effective alternative if you had nothing else and German tanks were coming right at you. The interesting thing about this is that the 76 millimeter caliber was first used out of necessity. In the early days of Operation Barbarossa, the Red Army suffered a critical shortage of anti-tank artillery of any kind. So you don't really have 45 millimeter anti-tank guns, let alone anything larger and more serious. The only thing that Soviet field artillery had, more or less, was 76 millimeter guns. Typically, these were inherited from the Tsarist army, and they predated the invention of the tank in general, let alone anti-tank weapons. But when that's all you have, that's all you have to work with, and you might as well give it a try. And it turned out, well, not too shabby. Uh, reports from the field indicated that this type of weapon was very effective against tanks with 30 millimeter thick armor or less. At angles of impact of under 30 degrees, it was recommended to set the fuse to high explosive action. At angles greater than 30 degrees, it was recommended to set the fuse to fragmentation action. Uh, the delay fuse setting was ineffective and should not be used in any case. The same report uh, also states that the 85mm model 1931 EA gun was also quite effective against tanks penetrating up to 50 millimeters of armor. However, I'm not sure which gun the report actually means because there was no such thing. There's a 76mm model 1931 EA gun and then there's the 85mm model 1939 EA gun. Uh, both would have a higher muzzle velocity and superior armor piercing performance even with high explosive ammunition so uh who knows but uh it works to confirm one thing that yes a field artillery of all types was being used in um an improvised anti-tank role in 1941 and it was used to quite considerable effect the limitations of 30 millimeter uh thick plate that could be penetrated was of course well annoying but uh in 1941 very few German tanks had more armor than that. The most powerful armor would be found on the latest model of the Panzer III tank. But, well, most tanks were not the latest models. Uh, and even on the latest Panzer IVs, the armor was not 50 millimeters thick. It was 30 millimeters thick with 30 millimeters of applique armor. And after one or two hits, that armor usually fell off because the bolts were shattered or the armor plate itself was shattered. So the field guns would be an effective weapon against pretty much any German tank they would find in 1941. Rather than just relying on battlefield reports, actual penetration trials were also performed, and the results, well, actually confirmed uh, what Red Army artillery men were finding in real life. Uh, at a range of 500 meters, the 76 millimeter high explosive round fired from the Model 1902 um, field gun penetrated 28 millimeters of armor. At uh, ranges of up to 3,500 3, meters, that amount dropped to 20 millimeters. Uh, 20 millimeters, of course, is not that much, but when you're fighting light armor like half tracks or armored cars, it's still perfectly fine. And well, even German medium tanks like the Panzer 3 and 4 had places where the armor was just 20 millimeters thick. So these guns would still be effective weapons, even if, if you play World of Tanks or some game like that, uh, 76 millimeter high explosive really doesn't do any damage to armor at all. And well, since this is tank archives, we finally get to talk about tanks, uh, particularly the 76 millimeter gun on the T-34, the F-34. Uh, the trials that were carried out with the F-34 were not 
theoretical, they were actually quite necessary and useful. That is because the Red Army had critical shortages of 76mm armor-piercing ammunition. So in many cases, when T-34 tanks were engaging the enemy in 1941, all they had to work with was high explosive, or in some cases, no cannon ammunition at all. But, well, when you're firing high explosive, you can still have some effect on enemy tanks, as we discovered. The first victim of the T-34 was the Panzer 38T tank. This was a light tank, but for a light tank, it actually had pretty decent protection. The front of the hull and front of the turret had 25 millimeters of main armor plus another bolted plate for a total of 50 millimeters, which was for a, mind you, light tank in 1941, really quite good. This made its frontal protection about equivalent to that of the latest German medium tanks. The front armor, 25 plus 25 millimeters, withstood high explosive hits from the T-34 actually pretty well. Uh, the front plate, the outer plate, was penetrated or entirely destroyed in these trials, uh, but the main armor suffered superficial damage. However, this was still brittle damage. Rivets would pop out, cracks would go through the armor, it was clear you can't sustain too many hits from a 76mm gun, because after one or two hits, your armor would simply fall apart. Uh, when aiming at the sides, well, this was a completely different story. Uh, massive jagged holes would form from the impact of a 76mm gun uh, in the 30mm thick armor plate. Rivets would pop, the whole tank was just kind of falling apart under this kind of fire. So, of course, nobody expected a light tank of Panzer 38C to stand up to a T-34, but if it runs into, say, a field artillery battery, the result would also be quite unpleasant for the German light tank. The next tank to go up against the T-34 was a worthier opponent, the Panzer III. Uh, now, unfortunately, in this, the tank that was uh, under fire did have 30mm thick front armor with another 30mm thick layer of applique armor. But only armor-piercing ammunition was used against that plate. Uh, so we can't really compare the effect of 76mm high explosive between German armor and Czech armor. Uh, the high explosive ammunition was only fired against the side, which was 30mm thick. Uh, now, as you remember from previous trials, it was concluded that 30mm thick armor could be penetrated from about 500 meters. Now, the Soviets in these trials tried a much longer distance, about 800 meters, uh, and the effect was equally devastating. The first hit to the 30 millimeter thick side actually destroyed a considerable portion of it, creating a breach that was one entire meter long. Uh, other hits on the turret and the side resulted in similarly lethal damage. Interestingly enough, there was another aspect to the trial where a American 75mm gun was used, uh, an M3 Lee tank with the 75mm M2 took part and fired high explosive shells not at a Panzer III but at a Stug which had similar thickness of armor. Uh, the result was very different, uh, even at a range of only 200 meters the shell just splashed on the surface without dealing any considerable harm to the tank. Uh, whether or not this was because of the shell or because of the lower muzzle velocity of the M2, I don't know. A few shots were made at a range between 200 and 800 meters before this type of shot was deemed ineffective. Uh, as you can clearly see, Soviet high explosive was a much, much more potent anti-tank weapon than American high explosive of similar caliber. Next, we have another medium tank, the Panzer IV. Uh, it was attacked in similar condition to the Panzer III, and the results were equally devastating. The first hit was scored on the side of the turret, on the door, and the door was blown away completely, with the side of the turret caving in a little bit under the effect of the blast. The second hit hit the commander's cupola, uh, the cupola was actually torn off the tank completely by this impact, landing about 5 meters away from the tank. The doors of the cupola were actually also blown off and landed at a greater range of 30 whole meters. Finally, the third hit was to the side of the tank, creating a hole 13 by 35 centimeters in size. So 
considerably larger than the caliber of the tank, showing that the armor that it hit was quite brittle. The conclusion to these trials was not surprising. When fired from the 76mm F-34 Model 1940 tank gun, the 76mm long-range steel HE grenade destroys armor plate and destroys the components and crew of the tank with fragments of the shell and the armor plate at a range of 1,000 meters. Since the ballistics of the 76mm gun used in the T-34 tank were about the same as that of guns used in a field artillery role, you can extrapolate that, in reality, the effect of a 76mm HE shell fired from, say, a ZIS-3 gun would be about the same. Uh, so, rather than being able to destroy a German tank at 300 meters or 500 meters, it could be used at a range of up to a kilometer. And that's noting that, in this specific trial, longer ranges were not tried. So, as you can see, any Soviet gun battery could be effectively used against German tanks, even if it lacked uh, special ammunition. So let's forward a few years to 1943. The Soviets have more or less figured their stuff out. Uh, the supply of 76mm AP is satisfactory. There's enough anti-tank guns to make all sorts of even specialized anti-tank batteries. Things are going pretty well until the Germans go and introduce a whole bunch of new tanks with very thick armor. And of course, that means new trials, which started pretty much as soon, anybody, as soon as anybody captured any of these new tanks. Now, since 76mm AP was plentiful and available, there's not that much HE that you see being used in trials. Uh, there's only one instance that I found against a Panther tank a ZIS-3 gun firing 76mm HE at a range of 250 meters, hitting a 45mm thick armor plate, still managed to penetrate it, creating significant amount of fragments, both coming from the shell and from the armor plate, that just would have destroyed components and crew inside the Panther tank, rendering it, at the very least, a mission kill. It would appear this is satisfactory damage, since the manual created on fighting Panther tanks did include the suggestion to fire high explosive shells at the sides, particularly under the skirt, and the rear of the hull. The manual for fighting Tiger tanks actually also includes the suggestion of firing high explosive, 76 millimeters or greater. In this case, the target provided is the lower edge of the turret. Uh, the goal here being using the blast to cave in a hole through the roof. I haven't seen any trials suggesting whether or not this type of attack was actually profitable. Um, but in American anti-tank trials using 75 um, millimeter high explosive fired by Sherman tanks from these M3 gun, similar attacks were carried out successfully. Uh, so impact on the lower edge of the turret of a Panther tank um, to cave in the tank's roof. And so Soviet 76mm HE should be able to achieve at the very least similar results. To conclude, while the effect of 152 and 122mm shells on enemy armor is pretty well known, the 76mm gun was no slouch either. In in a pinch, uh, if high explosive ammunition is all you've got on hand, you can still engage German tank columns and expect to have pretty good results against light, medium, or if fortune is on your side, even heavy armor.